What's up everybody, EJ here, and I have a pretty big announcement. I'm learning Unreal Engine, and I think you should too. I've teamed up with Unreal Engine guru, Jonathan Winbush. What up, what up, Winbush here. To create this tutorial that's actually a little bit more like a visual podcast. So in this video, Winbush is gonna be walking me through how to create this forest scene inside of Unreal Engine. And along the way, we're going to be seeing how Unreal works in relation to Cinema 4D. Seeing what features are similar, just to help us make those connections in our brain to try to understand how Unreal works and all the features and settings that may be pretty similar to what we have inside of Cinema 4D. We'll also be discussing how Unreal Engine is being used in motion design right now and how we think it's going to be a massive player in the motion design field in the years to come. We even talk about a contest that we have going on that is going to incentivize you to learn Unreal Engine with some pretty awesome prizes. So if you want to learn about that, check out the links in the description. Now, if you just want to check out how to build up the forest scene without the back and forth banter between myself and Winbush, you can check out that step-by-step -step tutorial over on Winbush's YouTube channel. I'll have a link for it somewhere here or in the description below. But this video is very much a conversation between myself and Winbush on Unreal and me trying to make observations and trying to lean on my knowledge of how Cinema 4D works and trying to apply those similar concepts and seeing how those translate to how Unreal Unreal Engine works and we had a lot of fun recording this and I hope you have just as much fun watching it so let's check it out all right so uh, we are looking in Unreal right now and I have no idea what any of these buttons are so uh, take it away my man Wimbush <laughs> all right so Tell we're, me in... What's going on. <laughs> we're in Unreal Engine 5 right now so I have a basic scene set up with this pug statue and a ground plane and we have a directional light, which is going to be on there by default. And so what I'm going to do for this first step is actually work on the lighting and everything. So I'm going to bring in our atmospheric effects, our lights, our sky, your clouds and all that good stuff. And so, you know, we're going to jump right into it. I'm going to delete. So now this little area here, this outliner, is that basically the like C4D object manager where all your assets kind of show up? Yep, 100%. So it's just, you know, it's named something different, but this is your object manager. So this is where you're going to see everything that populates your scene is going to come over here. And you can even set up folders and everything to kind of organize it as well. And so I'm going to get started by deleting this directional light. And your scene is going to go completely black, but that's okay because we're going to start adding in the pieces that we need to get photo row lighting one by one. And so to get started, I'm going to come up here in the top left hand corner where it says window. I'm going to left click and I'm going to come down here to where it says environmental light mixture. And you'll just open up this panel here and you'll have all your panel buttons here. And we're just going to click these on one by one. Right. And so let, let me actually make this a little bit smaller and move it to my right. So we can see the stuff happening inside the panel here. And I can actually move this down a little bit so we can see it populating in the outliner as well. Because it's just a couple of buttons that we have here, right? So you can see that final you're in. So I'm going to start with the skylight here. That's right next to minimal. Click on create skylight. You can see it came into our outliner, but we still see nothing in our viewport. And that's because we want to start adding our atmospheric light, just the one that says zero. We don't want to add the one that says one. I'm not really sure what that one does, but... I'm going to click this one on and you can see now we have a directional light within our scene, which is basically our sunlight there. And so from here, I'm going to create sky atmosphere, which is going to add our atmosphere into here and everything. And you can actually see our sun over there on the left hand side, but you can still see like our horizon is black and everything. We need to blend that in. So I'm actually going to, before I blend that in, I'm actually going to create volumetric clouds just to add some clouds up in our sky still see our sun and everything over there which is crazy like i said I, I think i was telling you before like i did a tutorial on this back in the day and it took at least like 15 minutes to set that up but now it's just one click and you're one good button to go click. and those yeah. clouds are are moving too are they moving yeah they're always moving yeah. so that's, that's the insane. thing in, that's so <laughs> in cool. unreal this stuff is always moving real in. time yeah 60 frames per second at its best you know and then I'm going to create a height fog there 
and that's how we're going to blend everything in in there so i'm actually going to exit this out so basically we wanted to put everything in there except for create atmospheric light one again i'd have to read up on it but i'm not sure what that does but don't really need it so now we have our environment and our sun and our clouds and our height fog and everything else in here right so what i like to do oh, i'm sorry go ahead i was gonna say this reminds me exactly of like the sun and sky rig uh that you'd create in in uh redshift right right 100 percent. it's been okay, a minute you since. also rotate around like the sun and sky rig in cinema or in redshift where you can change the time of day and all that yeah so i'm going to hold down a shortcut key on my keyboard so i'm going to hold down the control key on my keyboard and then i'm going to hold down the l key on my keyboard and you see like we have this little send out here so I'm not going to click anything on my mouse at all. I'm just going to move my mouse around and navigate it as so. So if I start moving this around and you can even see like it's like dawn, right? This is where the sunset right there. And you get like the color temperature and everything affecting everything in your scene, which is really dope. So this is pretty much just like moving the sundial in real time inside of your scene here. I mean, this is the this is the cool thing about unreal and you know we talk about this all the time that if you know one 3d app like there's so many connections to other apps that you can relate to like oh this is redshift sun and sky rig and you basically can connect all those dots and really get grounded in this totally different 3d app but it's a 3d app none the same yeah i mean 100 percent. like i mean it's just across the spectrum like most of the stuff applies across the board but they're just named differently per app that you're in so yeah, it's it's super simple. Once you like learn the navigational tools and how to just get around in here, you feel right at home. So next up from here, I'm actually going to just clean this up a little bit. So right here where it says main, I'm just going to right click and create a new folder. And I'm just going to name this one FX. And I'm going to put all that stuff that I just put into my scene for the lighting and atmosphere and stuff. I'm going to put that into my FX folder there like so. And then I'm going to make another folder and I'm just going to name it main because I'm just going to drag my ground plane in there and then also the guest statue as well. Like so. So now we're all cleaned up and everything over here. And so what I like to do, especially when I make big steps, I always like to save everything in my project. I'm just a huge, you know, control S person, but instead of unreal control S doesn't save everything for some reason. Like you usually have to come down here to your content drawer, which would be, what was that? Like your object your manager, or your content browser. browser? Actually, yeah. I think it's called asset browser now in later versions of C4D. So this is like just where all of your stuff is. Basically, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All your junk, your 3D junk. All your stuff that you drag into your scene, like your FBXs and materials and HDRs, this will all be inside your content browser. And oh, okay. You can right click and you can make new folders and stuff like that. You can add particle systems, um, blueprint if you want to get into, you know, programming and stuff like that. But we're not going to no. touch that today. No, so. I don't want to get into programming. Too much. <laughs> I'm just basically <laughs> going to save all in my scene. And I'll just name the scene Gus like so. And there we go. So it added a new level. I'm not sure why it did that, but like these little buttons down here with like the yellow bars, these are basically mm -hmm. your levels, right? And that's almost like working in, I would say like a pre-comp in After Effects, but not exactly. Okay. Like a new level would be your new scene altogether. So like, say like you wanted to use the Gus statue in like a completely new level, like all your assets mm -hmm. would still be here, but you could still use those assets in a new level if you wanted to make like a totally new scene. So I okay. guess it's not a pre-comp, but yeah, it's kind of hard for me to explain except for it's a completely new project, but you can still use audit assets that are in your content browser. So that's the thing. Yeah. Like this is at the end of the day, people make video games with this. So you got to kind of relate what is going on with a video, like in a video game use case versus like actually we're doing kind of motiony, graphic-y, like Octane and Redshift style renders in this. So it's like. Right. Even though it's called a level, it's just like a scene. And I almost think of like Mario Maker, the video <laughs> game where it's like right. you have all those different assets that populate. We could, are you in the desert world and have the desert 
themed uh, stuff for that level. So kind of, right. kind of following along here. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty. I mean, that was a good analogy. The Mario Maker. Forgot all about that game, but yeah, pretty much game. right up the aisle. So <laughs> it's a good game for about a week, and then you're just yeah. like, all right, that was fun. <laughs> We're good. So I'm actually going to just add some some fog into the scene now, since we're already here inside of our atmosphere and stuff like that. So if I click on exponential height fog right here in my outliner, if I scroll this up down here, we have our details panel, which is basically where all of our attributes are. So if you're in Cinema 4D, it's the attributes panel, right? So that's what all this stuff is. That's where you have like your location, yeah, your transform tools, your scaling tools. But if I scroll all the way down here there should be a button to turn on volumetric fog which is right here so i would just turn on volumetric fog you can see that the scattering has already started to implement itself into the scene but if i scroll up to the top here where it says fog density and let's crank this up to like one now you can see we have our moody fog in here the scatter is all over the place and if you're wondering how I'm moving so fast in my scene, is basically the controls inside of Unreal is like you're playing a video game, right? So like if you play like Halo or Call of Duty or Fortnite, it's the W A S D keys on your keyboard, and then the mouse would control your um your camera there. So I'm just holding down the right button on my mouse, and if I hold down S, I'm moving backwards, right? And if I hold down W, I'm moving forward, and then A moves to the left, and D moves to the right. Okay. And, that makes total sense. So, yeah, any video game. I mean, like we were saying, it's a game engine. So the controls are going to control just how you're playing the video game. And then if I hit Q, that actually goes down. And if I hit E, that just pans up. And you, you can also use the middle mouse on your controller too. Or not your controller, but <laughs> on your mouse to just kind of pan around. But no, it's funny because I say controller, like if you hook up like a PlayStation or an Xbox controller, you can actually navigate around your scene with the controller oh, wow. as well. So That's yeah, super it's, dope. it's pretty wild. And if you just scroll in, you're just going to jump in like increments like that, right? So yeah, that's a, that's a quick navigation run down there. And then um, if I hold down the right click on my keyboard and I scroll back on my mouse, like scrolling towards me, now if I hit the S, it's going slower. But then if I move my mouse wheel forward, like if I scroll forward, now if I hit W, you can see now it's going fast. So that's how you control your camera speed too. So that's just your mouse wheel, you know, moving it up and down, which is very handy there. So like I love we'll the way. We'll provide like a we'll provide a PDF for all this stuff so you can download because I know I'm gonna need it as a reference to remember all this stuff. But just so you know download that pdf with all the shortcut keys that we're covering yeah 100 percent. but i mean this should come natural well at least for us you know like we play games so i'm a switch like, person so it's a little bit i don't play a lot of <laughs> pc games so i don't know uh, well it i don't know for me like the navigation was the big thing when i jumped from cinema 40 to unreal like at first i didn't right. like it but the more i used yeah. unreal i'm like now nah, i wish you know, cinema worked like this like it just works so fast, you know, so. Yeah. But let's start adding this some. This fog's looking great. What's that? I said this fog is looking great. Like, that, again, like I'm just thinking of like, oh, this is inside the Redshift environment object that you can adjust the fog just like this uh, in, uh, in Unreal. Yeah, like the tools are almost identical. So, yeah. I mean, that's why it was so easy for me to jump over, right? Just because I did know the background and, you know, like texturing and lighting and stuff like that right. coming from offline renders. And so, right, right. But we're going to get into some texturing now, right? We want to start texturing the ground plane here. And so we have this little box with like this green plus arrow. And this is how you can add stuff to your project. So if I click on it, you can see we have access to Quixel Bridge. The Unreal Marketplace, um, you have your lights down there, basic shapes, you can add your camera, etc. So I'm going to jump right into Quixel Bridge here just to get right into it. And as you can see here, this is going to pop up at first. Like they do a lot of stuff in collections, right? Like they usually have like the new stuff that they scan there. But if you wanted to jump into like say this Tundra pack, like I'm not sure what part of the world they scan this stuff, but 
basically everything they scanned in this region they put in the little collections so if you want everything to be cohesive and you download it like a material or a 3d object there then everything they scanned in that area is going to be in this pack so it's kind of like a good jump off point if you just want to build like a scene and make sure everything is going to blend with each other very well like that's basically what you would do you just come over to your collection and they also included the references and so if you click on reference oh, wow. these are, are the actual renders? photos no these are the actual oh, photos the actual of photos. the area oh, wow. so if you that's wanted to have a reference on like hey i want to build out this scene these are the reference photos from where they scanned it at and you can see so that you have like a point of reference for yourself when you're building this stuff out so it's crazy it's yeah like that's Lord of the rings <laughs> I mean, they might have scanned this in New Zealand. I know right, they yeah. travel all over. But if you click yeah. on renders, these are some of the renders that well, I mean, they those actually look did. like the photos we we're just looking at. That's insane. Exactly. So <laughs> let me. Um, I'm gonna go over to some of the textures that I already downloaded here. And so I'm gonna come over here to like this little computer monitor looking thing, and this is all stuff that you downloaded local, and so it just saves on your hard drive automatically, right? So. You can also go back and access it. But if I click on surfaces, this is going to show me all the materials that I downloaded to my hard drive. And so these are the latest ones that I use whenever I was building out the the pug scene here in the past, because I was using like a mossy ground, I added like some swamp materials, and then I had a rocky material as well. So what I want to do from here is actually click on it. And I want to make sure that I'm on highest quality, which is going to be 8K. But if you go through these different quality settings, like I believe high quality would be 4K, medium would be 2K. And I want to say low quality is either 1K or 512 megabytes. I can't remember which one, but I always go balls to the wall with 8K, right? So just yeah. get that. You can the handle highest, it 8K. <laughs> the highest fidelity that you could get. 8K but, in real time. That's a real flex right there. But I mean, the crazy part is like I'm using a 2080 Ti still, right? Like I do have a thread for CPU, but I'm using a GPU that's two generations back and I'm still able to handle everything in real time here. So I can only imagine if you have like a 3090 or something up there or even like a 40 series, you know? Yeah. And while we're on the subject, like you can use Unreal on a Mac too, right? Some of the uh, later Macs and stuff. It's not like you, it's not like Redshift or... You know, Octane's been better about it, but if you're on a Mac, you're kind of SOL on <laughs> using like, you know, yeah. some of the render stuff, you got to have a certain uh, GPU. So that's kind of a really cool thing about uh, uh, Unreal. Although C4D j did just update with the CPU render in included in S26. So yeah, for Richard. hopefully, hopefully everyone can just use everything all the time. So, but it's cool that but Unreal is, you know, all over the place. Yeah, and they, they've worked with NVIDIA and AMD, and um, mm -hmm. I've actually looked at the benchmarks. It actually runs better on AMD GPUs than NVIDIA, oh, which is kind of crazy because when they were working on Unreal Engine 5, they were working closely with Xbox and PlayStation, which mm -hmm. those consoles actually use like AMD hardware inside of there for the CPU and GPU. So it kind of makes sense that they optimized it to really run efficiently on AMD. So like EJ was saying, like if you have an AMD system or a Mac, I mean, you should be able to use Unreal with no problem. So mm -hmm. awesome. Getting back into it, I'm actually going to select these three materials and add these to my scene. So I'm just going to click, like if you didn't already have them downloaded, you would just hit the download button, you know, it gives you your percentage right there. Once it's done, you'll get a green check mark like so. And then this blue button down here for add will pop up. So I'm just going to actually click on add and then give it a second because it's going to populate inside of Unreal. But once it does, I'm going to show you guys how we could take these three materials and turn them into a blend material so that we can actually start painting on our ground plane there. So we'll start off with like the mossy ground and then maybe paint in some of the rocks and we could paint in some of the swamp materials there as well and kind of make like a path leading up to the statue there, which is really dope. Yeah, it sounds like something that you would do in like Substance Painter or something like you can't. I'm trying to think of how I would do that in Cinema 4D. It would be like vertex maps and, and, and redshift uh, color composite nodes and all that kind of stuff. Yep, yep. So, so these are all those too. textures and it looks like like you get normal map. You got your normal maps. You got all this stuff in there. They look awesome. 
yeah, everything that you would need for that texture is already set up. So if I double click on like this mossy ground and come into this is um this is the material and they already built it out inside of Mega Scan so you don't have to do anything. Like if I look at my let's see, if I look at the hierarchy window. Oh wow, got nodes. Yeah, these are all the nodes for that and they already have them all set up for you and everything and they they laid it out really nice so you don't have to miss with anything in there and that i don't even think that was like the big one but yeah getting back into it like you could change the abito tint you can add specular to their roughness um they already have all the textures already plugged into where you need them to be plugged into but you also have control over you know subsurface scattering if you wanted to add that like everything is laid out really nice here if you wanted to kind of take these one step further and kind of do what you want with them and so what i'm going to do is set these up as a blend material so down here inside of my content browser what i'm going to do is actually click on the surface because whenever you add anything from mega scans it's actually going to add a mega scans folder here for you right it then it automatically separates everything so if you bring in like a 3d asset it will make a 3d folder um, if you have like a decal and make a decal folder or, you know, your textures, which would be your surfaces, it automatically added a surface folder and it will populate everything accordingly. So you can keep everything organized. And so what I'm going to do is click on my surface folder and right here we have a search bar because that material that I was just showing you all the attributes, those are called instances inside of Unreal Engine. And so I want to make sure that I select each material instance in order of operation pretty much. So I believe like you said in the past, it's like working in Photoshop, right? Like how you select your layers and everything would be from the top down. And so this is very important for you whenever you're making a blend layer, you want to make sure you pick your base material first and then you hold down the shift key. And let's say next, I want to do like this mossy swamp. I'm just, oh, actually hold this down, hold down the control key, hit mossy swamp, and then say my third material, I want to do this mossy rock. So I'm going to left click on that. And so now my order of operation is, this is my base layer. This is my second paint layer. And then this will be my third paint layer. Okay, so very important that order. Yep. And then to make a blend layer, it will automatically make it for you. If I go back over to Quixel Bridge and you see like this, right? You like, you have to click on the material, right? And then you'll have mm -hmm. this menu pop up and right next mm -hmm. to where it says highest quality. You want to select on this button icony thing here. I'm not really sure yeah. what it is, but a little slidery you, thing. Yeah. A little hamburger sliders or whatnot. Oh, what happened? Hamburger sliders right now. I'm ready for lunch. <laughs> So now that pops up this screen that just says mega scans up top, right? And we don't have to do anything in here. Like everything should be good to go. So all you have to do is hit create blend material and boom, you see it made a folder right here called blend material. So we can actually exit this out. And if I come over to blend materials, now we have a new instance for this blend material, right? So if I double click on this, I'm actually going to save it. But if you look over here, we have all of our materials. So let me actually just scroll through these. I'm gonna make these up so it's easier to see, but we have our, our base layer, which is our the first one that we selected. And then we have the middle layer, which would be the second one. And then the top layer, which would be the third one. And so to activate these, what we're gonna do is start right here where it says global. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna scroll this down and I want to make sure I activate my base layer. You want to make sure that you have this checked mark along with the one on the right hand side as well. And once you click that, you can see that it activated everything down here. So we're able to change same as before. You could change like your roughness maps. You can, um, you could do tiling and stuff down here, which we'll go through in a minute. And it just opens up all these attributes in here. If you want to kind of, you know, manipulate these and everything. So I'm going to do the same thing for the middle and top layer because I want to just get right into the fun stuff here. And then I'm actually going to turn on this puddle layer as well, because you can paint in like little mud puddles or wet spots on your material as well, if you want to, which is really dope. So what I'm going to do now, uh, actually, before I do anything else right here, where it says blend control, I'm going to select this on as well. And then I'm going to click save and we should be good. All right. So 
what I'm going to do now is put my blend material onto my ground plane. And you can see that it looks crazy right now. And that's because we have to blend our material, right? Or not blend it, but, you know, change out the scaling and everything. Scale so it's pretty massive. Yeah. I'm pretty going to <laughs> take it to the jank town. <laughs> I was going to say flavor town. Like, um, it's a flavor town. I don't know. Yeah, no. <laughs> you don't want to go to flavor town with what's his face. Yeah. Um, Guy Fury. Guy Fury, go. no. I go. mean, that texture kind of looks like his hair right now. <laughs> well, what we're going to do is I'm scrolling over here. Like, I double clicked uh -huh. on my blend material. And so I'm going to go like to my. This is like your material manager. I'm like just making that kind of connection here. Yep. It's just exactly like that. I'm going to come over here to where it says base layer because that's what we're seeing right now. I'm going to scroll down to the bottom here and I'm just going to. I have it activated, but. I'm going to change this from tiling X to 35 and my tiling Y to 35. I think that looks pretty good like that. And so now what I want to do is actually, I'm going to change my tiling on my middle layer as well, because we're going to start painting this in. And so my middle layer, I'm going to scale down, click on the tiling right here, tiling slash offset. And let's change this to 35. And this is all non-destructive too. So like we can always change the telling afterwards yeah. if you want. And this is like the same stuff they got in like your Redshift texture node and all that kind of stuff. So this is like, this is jiving with how my brain works with other renderers. Yeah, 100%. So now we have our texture on here. What we're going to do now is start painting on some textures. And so to do that right here where it says select mode, I'm going to left click and come down here to where it says mesh paint, right? So I'm going to click on mesh paint and it's going to open up this other window in which I don't need anything in my content browser right now. So I'm just going to close this out. So we have maximum room here so you guys can see everything. So let me actually move this over as well because I just want to show the viewport and show I starting to paint on it. So I'm going to come over here to where it says colors, which should already be selected. I'm going to come down here to where it says paint the mesh. Click on this little paintbrush. And that should open up some more attributes down here in which we have our brush um, attributes here. So our size, like if I come in here, you can see this is my paintbrush. If I move it up to like one, it pretty much engulfed the entire scene. If I do 0 0.01, you can see how tiny it is. And each one of those little green dots, that's actually your vertice on your mesh. And so that's kind of important too. Whenever you're, you're working on the mesh, like I brought the ground plane in from Cinema 4D, right? Like I made just the terrain and then I exported it out as an FBX and I brought it in here, but I made sure that I had a very high polygon count in Cinema 4D because if you have a low polygon count, you're not going to get that much um, blending in here because the more vertices you have, the better blending you can have afterwards when we start painting our textures on and everything. So, okay. That's just so you'll have like more there. higher resolution blending the the denser your mesh is. Yep, exactly. Okay, that makes sense. If it's, so it's if, all, is this like a because that reminds me of like you would also need that for a vertex map too. Is that kind of what's going on behind the scenes? Is like vertex map kind of stuff or? Yep, yep, I similar. believe so. Okay. Yep. Awesome, makes sense. If so I'm going to um and you also have control over like your strength and your fall off too, right? So I usually just have both of these at one. But you can also control the fall off and everything afterwards as well. And so when you come down here, it looks like I already have it set up. But my paint color is usually going to be white right off the bat. And we want to make sure that it is black. So if I click on it and scroll down, you just want to make sure that your paint color is black and your race color is white. When you first open this up, it's going to usually be in the opposite direction. So that's very important there. Um, I know, well, I, it's like working with mask inside of Photoshop, right? right? Black and so, white mats, yeah. Yeah, pretty much. And so I can't remember how it is inside of Photoshop, but yeah, we'll just equate it to that. And so down here where we see color painting, you want to make sure that you only have one of these channels selected at a time. And so your red is going to be basically the second material that you selected. Your green is going to be the third material you selected. And then the blue that one's going to be your puddles, which we, you know, select inside of our blend materials there. So this is just basically going in an order of operation, how we selected everything when we first set everything up. So now for the fun part 
if I left click and start painting on my texture, now you can see we're starting to paint that second material on there. Just That's like so. Awesome. So if now, I scroll, is there a way to like uh like add noise or something to break that up a little bit too? Yeah, one hundred percent. So if I look down here where I have my blend material down here, you can either do it in your content browser or since I have my ground plane already selected, you should see the associated material in here. So if I double click on this, it's gonna open up my window here for my um my blend material. So if I come over here and if I um right here where it says blend controls, you can see that we have blend amount, we have contrast, we have fall off. So let me see. It'd probably be better if I move it over here to the right or the left, right? So we can see it better. But let me scroll in here so we can really see what's going to happen. So if I do blend them out, let's move this up to like 10. Oh, wow. So that's like procedural. Yeah, it's all procedural and non-destructive. Oh, so awesome. you can see how it's really blending it together. But let's say we want to keep it at two. Like the smaller the increments, the closer to your paint is going to be but if you exaggerate it then it's going to start engulfing everything right so let's say maybe around three and you can start to see it starting to blend there and then the contrast if i take it down so it's like using a noise to blend the stuff together and it's so you're basically controlling the strength of the noise the contrast of the noise that's awesome. yep 100 percent. and then let's say for fall off take it say down a point one somewhere around there you can start seeing that and then yeah so i mean that's it's really dope like the amount of this control is incredible that like, you have to do this it. in cinema 4d i mean i don't even think you can <laughs> i mean it would, <laughs> it would require a crap ton of redshift nodes or octane nodes i know that but to just do this so procedurally but, is really incredible but check this out so let's say like, okay, so maybe we say like, okay, we're not happy with the tiling and everything. Maybe it's too large or too small. You could go back and remember I said it's not constructive. So I could just start changing the tiling in here as well. So now we're changing out the tiling as well in here. Let's see, 100 by 100 maybe. Two tally. All right, let's go 75. But if it's too tidy, you know what you could do is actually let me close this out and let me come down here to my green paint brush and I could start painting this in, but that we didn't even tell that one. So yeah, we didn't even tell <laughs> that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's not tidy enough. Yeah. Which it's is like, a new word we just invented just today. No towels. So let's make see. that more tidy. There, there you go. Is. Oh, cool. So you can like help break up the uh, monotony of uh, some of those patterns. Like if you could visually see that pattern, all you got to do is break it up with another material there. Yeah. And I think, oops. So this one, I'm doing a top blend right here. So I'm just trying to blend this in a little bit as well. So let me see. So you so. can control blend control. So you also have to adjust the blend control of the other material for that to blend. Yep. That makes so sense. you can, you can control both of those there. So let's say I want to have like the rock path going up to the statue here. So I'm just painting this on like, so And then let's say maybe where like this mossy area, we want it to be a little bit more wet. If I come back over here, and go down to blue, we can start painting on like little puddles and stuff as well. So you can paint on puddles and let me see. You can see the reflection in there. It might look a little bit better if I change the lighting. So let me change. Oh, wow. Yep. So you can see like the light reflections and. Mm -hmm. Well, and depending oh. on the angle that light you're seeing that, uh, that normal map really pop those rocks. Yep. That's great. So, yeah, I mean, I love like this lighting shortcut again, that's control plus L and it's just like, if you're like starting to just really polish your scene, you just kind of move it around just to kind of see how it looks and see how dope it is. But 
this may be these leaves are huge now i'm looking at it so maybe let's oh, go yeah. in Didn't even know there was leaves there <laughs> <laughs> it's like the land of the giants so uh, come down uh probably even go higher than that now is it pretty good to like as far as when you bring in materials from quixel are they about the same like world scale so if you wanted everything consistent you would almost want to have like for these three materials like the tiling somewhat similar versus it depends you know. um yeah like the the scaling is usually consistent but i usually just go in and kind of play around with it just to see what's like visually appealing to the eye right yeah eyeball it a lot and so i think for now i'm going to get out of texture painting because um we'll get into some set design because once we start adding you know like mega scan stuff in here we might want to paint it differently so let's see where should we where should we start so i guess let's start by going into quixel bridge let's see some of the 3d assets that I have downloaded already all those little plants and stuff and gazebos yeah so we have the japanese wooden roof which is dope if i come over again if i click on like your 3d object you can see that sometimes they have the collection already here so like say we want to work on like a japanese garden if i click on this this is like what the render looks like that either people at quixel made or it looks like this was like a community one which you can click on that it will take you to like his art station and everything but you can see the render that he made and then it also shows you all the different assets that he used to make out that scene there as well so again that's just for continuity if you want stuff to be you know coherent then you have your collection there so i guess we could start with maybe the little what would you call that like a gazebo a thing or something game. or sure all right let's add that and down here you can see that it actually says nanite in which I don't know. Did we talk about Nanite yet or? No, we haven't. So that's like kind of the, so we, we covered the material quality, you know, and this is basically the density of the mesh. Cause I know they have like a few views, uh, Quixel before they have like the level of detail, the LOD one, two, three, whatever. And, yep. uh, Nanite is something that if you're, I'm sure there's a lot of artists watching this that have used Quixel before for cinema 4d and Nanite from what I understand, it is something just totally inside of Unreal. Yeah, so it is the most dense mesh that you could get. Like, the whole concept behind it is, you know, as the entertainment world and the gaming world is starting to really collide with each other, it would be cool, like, say, like, Industrial Light and Magic, if they're working on, like, the Spider-Man movie, and then you have the Spider-Man game being created at the same time, that you know industrial light and magic can actually take like the high-end polygon meshes that they created for the movie for the vfx team and just pass it over to the game studio and then they could just take those directly into unreal and not have to worry about like reducing the meshes you know like really like destroying the polygons to kind of make it work to be optimized within unreal now it's kind of just like hey give me that high trillion polygon meshes spider-man and i could just throw them in here and everything just works and so it's just it's really trying to just combine like the entertainment world and the gaming world together and i'm not sure the magic behind it but yeah it just it works like it's i've done math. some yeah math it, and science it, something like that which i'm good <laughs> at but not at not at right. this level right not so. that level no <laughs> yeah i know the but, sky is blue uh which it is in this scene, but out, outside of that, that's where my science ends. So but, you, how do you, uh, how are you scaling there? Where are your scale and rotate tools? Yeah. Uh, so I know cinema 4d it's ERT or whatever. Is there something similar? So yeah, basically we want, when we were talking about Nanite, all I did was mm -hmm. remember before we said mega scans, when you add something, I will make a yep. folder. So I went to my 3d folder the Japanese wooden shelf thing here. And all I did was click mm -hmm. and drag it into my scene and you just start placing it. And then this is where all your transformation tools are at the top. Oh, okay. So, right up there. All right. Yeah. And if you hover over it, it will actually tell you the shortcut key to get there as well. So like your scale key, you have your rotation right here. So if I wanted to rotate it like so, and then this is just how you would move it in your scene. And then right here, this is your selection only. So like you can select stuff 
but it's not going to have any of the transformation tools that can which, accidentally move it. Yeah, which I really like. You can select stuff and not move it around, which comes in handy. And then right here, this is where you have like your world axes and your local, just like how you would have inside of Cinema 4D. Um, I'm gonna stick with world right here. And um, this is how you control, yeah, you could snap the surface type stuff. And then these right here, these will be like your snap grids, like how, mu how much of an increment they would move in. So like if, if I turn these all off and I start rotating, you can see that he's just rotating, but you know, if I turn them on, now you can see, yeah, it snaps to 10 like so. So I usually turn them off just because I just like to free flow it, but you know, however you like to work, it's up to you. So I don't like constraints in my life. Why would I want it in my 3D application? Exactly. So <laughs> I think I'm just gonna add maybe a couple more rocks or something in here because we want to get into the trees right like we really want to start yeah but i mean the key here is like of course we want to learn this new application uh but we also want to you know share tips as far as like designing these scenes and making it look realistic and uh you know you want to have your main your main actor pieces you know these nice little like what is the the main focal point of your animation if it's just a bunch of trees or not animation you're your uh, your render uh, if you just have a bunch of trees like what's the point of interest what am i looking at uh so you know we're, we're you know Winbush is working here getting these like main set pieces in here uh that'll look really nice and then uh you know start building up the nature here because we ultimately want this to be a pug forest so yeah. how do you build up a forest number one like i highly recommend people go out and uh you know, use Pinterest, use a bunch of uh, uh, reference images and because that's a really good guiding star to help you uh, build up your scene. So I know we looked at and I showed you Winbush some of those uh, Pinterest images uh, before and you know how it had like super mossy ground cover that almost covered the entire forest floor. And then of course in nature, like you have different sizes of trees. They're not all the same size tree. They're all not all the same kind of plant. Uh, so that's where, you know, not only utilizing all the assets in Unreal come in handy, but it's just, you know, realizing what happens in nature. Like you don't want everything to be super uh, uniform. Like, so for these rocks that Winbush is placing right now, you might want to rotate some or whatever uh, around just to break up the uh, monotony so just like you don't want obviously tiling textures, you don't want obviously tiling uh, rocks. I love the overlap of the, the stones too and how some are kind of sunk into the mud. Like even that's something you could look at a, a, an image reference and see that, hey, that's, you know, sometimes it's going to rain, it's going to flood and you're going to get mud that comes up on top of those, uh, those stones there. Uh, so Absolutely. you always want to think about, uh, yeah, you always want to think about uh, how to make this as realistic as possible for these kind of scenes. And the thing, like, I'm just, you know, while you're talking, I was just kind of freestyling and putting stuff together, but it's like, I know people are probably asking, like, how am I just like clicking and dragging and duplicating? So actually let me delete, I'm gonna delete that pillar and I'll start like this. And so this is how a lot of game artists actually design their scenes really fast. So if I hold down the alt key on my keyboard, and let's say I want to move this, you know, just left to right. I'm going to click on the X axis right here. Like when I hover over it, you'll see a highlight. So I'm just going to left click and drag and it automatically duplicates it, which is really dope. So that's, um, so that's like cinema 4d too. Yeah. But we, they use it in the gaming world like crazy. Like I watch a lot of gamers, like time lapse their video scenes and stuff. And you know, they're just like how I was selecting just like a group here. Like you just hold down shift. And then you just like hold down the alt key and you duplicate it. And like, I, I really wish that's something that cinema still has like on top of the game, especially when it comes to other applications is the cloner tool. Like I know you want to get in here and you kind of want to just, you know, detail it out. But a lot of times using the cloner tool would just even randomizing the rotation. And, you know, like we we're just saying where not every stone is going to be exactly orientated the same way as all the other stones. So, so yeah, there, but... is, is there any kind of cloner tool in Unreal? I'm just like asking just generally, you don't have to show it or anything. 
Yeah, yeah, no. There's people that have made them inside the marketplace, but like built okay. in, there's nothing yet. And so, like, you can already start to see some repeating yeah. patterns and stuff here. So, yeah, ways to break That's that up. Good. Like, you could probably just add, like, start layering other stuff in there. Yeah. Yeah. Practically yeah I mean, there's so just, many assets in there. Yeah, pretty much. And so, there's a whole plethora of stuff in here. Like, I like using these two. Like, if you look at Stone Rebel Pal. Like these are just like little like if you didn't want to paint in or hand place rocks like they have a bunch of these type of things too so like I could add this to the scene and then I could actually add that in there and it would just automatically start to blend in what you're seeing and everything which is really cool so let me edit this out and it should have already yeah added it already down here so I'm just going to click and drag sometimes it takes a second for your mesh to come through again these are like AK textures on top of these as well so if i just click and drag maybe just scale it up like so and just start blending it into where i want it to be sometimes it's good to have these things they just kind of that break just breaks up. up that monotony yeah that looks good yeah, and they blend so nicely because like you were saying they have that whole japanese shrine pack where all the assets are kind of made to work with each other yeah that's the one thing is like they're shooting all these things like in the same area so just naturally they should blend together but if they don't like say you wanted to use a pack from something else i mean you could go in there you could change the color you can always bring this into like substance painter and repaint the textures or bring it in a quicksil mixer stuff like that and so yeah because i mean the, all these materials you can go and change the the uh like hue or saturation or whatever to do whatever you want yep and so i think just for like the the path leading up to here i think is cool i think um what's really going to bring it home is adding maybe some mega scan trees to it and so like once we build like the forest out and everything like that then we're going to start getting like the the volumetric lighting effects we're going to get the god rays that we really want to get in there and we could just start really setting the tone and everything so i think what i'm going to do is I'm going to open up the Epic Games Launcher because I'm going to show you it on the store first. And then I'm going to show you how we can bring the Mega Scan Trees into Unreal Engine 5 because they haven't been updated for 5 yet. But I do have a workaround on how we can bring them into 5 so that we can utilize them. And so this is the Epic Games Launcher. Whenever you install Unreal Engine, this is what you're going to get. And this is how you actually reach, you know, like the different engines that you have in here. So if you look in the top right... You can see that it will say launch Unreal Engine 4. But if I click on this, I have five installed as well. And so like if you want to install different levels of engines in here, if I come over to library, you can actually see where it says engine versions. You can click on a plus sign and you can install any version up to, I think, like Unreal Engine 4.0, which is that's like really old. But like say that you're working on a project, somebody sent you a scene file from like 4.19 you can actually install it and then you can open it so you have access to everything there and if you want to have multiple versions of the engine you know installed at once you're able to do that as well and so what i like to do is like i primarily work in unreal engine 5 right but i also keep a version of unreal engine 4 which 4.27 will be the latest version but i keep that installed just because 5 just came out so like all the assets on the marketplace they haven't been updated for, you know, to be implemented into five directly. And so a workaround is make maybe like a, a blank scene inside of Unreal Engine 4. And you would just start adding your stuff from the marketplace in the four. And then it's as easy as opening up that project and just hit and migrate. And then you can migrate it over to five in which I'll show you in case that's, you know, that sounds too yeah. complicated. But. Sure. Yeah. Because I don't even know how to import files into anything yet. Either, so. <laughs> But under library, under library here, if you scroll down, like, well, first inside your library, you're going to see your projects. And so these are projects that I've worked on in the past. And they'll actually show you what engine number that you built them in as well, which is really cool. So you can see like the Boba Fat Thumb Room that I worked on down there and worked in five and yeah, some other stuff that I've done. But if I scroll all the way down to the vault, these are all stuff that I got from the marketplace. And so what's cool about Epic is they give away free assets every single month. So 
let me actually go to the marketplace so you can see first. So if I come over to the marketplace and then I go over here to free and click on free for the month. And so I want to say is every first Tuesday of the month, they will pick five assets from the store to give away free. So if you have um, if you have an Epic Games account, you can automatically come in and start claiming these like I've been claiming them for the past three years. But it's something that you want to make sure you do every month because they have some really good stuff in here like they even have, you know, 3D horse model That's pack. That's a nice horse model, man. That's a yeah, great horse model. And they're all, um, they think they have, like, all the animation and everything on them, too. Yeah, see, Idol, Trot, Walk, Gallop, and, yeah, it's pretty crazy. So, definitely go to the marketplace. Make sure you go into free, free for the month, and grab everything there. But also, you have permanently free collections. If I click on this, like this stuff is always going to be free. Like they just released a photo reel 747 jet, which is crazy right there. Um, you have uh, Archviz scene in here that's on um, photo reel. They should, and it's good to download these too. Like if you download this Archviz pack, you can see how they lit it. You can see like how they laid everything out. And it's just kind of good to go in there and backward engineer stuff. So. This stuff is really, really helpful, especially for people just getting started out, you know? But I'm gonna go back to library so I don't get too far off pace. And inside my vault, I'm gonna type in tree because this is where we have our Mega Scan Trees pack. They only released one pack so far, but it's called the European Black Alder. It says early access because I think they still need to update it for five. But if you come down here, where it says supported engine versions, you can see that it's only in 4.25 to 4.27. Like I said, they haven't added it for five yet, but the workaround is, so you start a project in Unreal Engine 4, right? And then right here where it says add the project, you would click on that and then I already have a scene. I usually have one called files and you can see that it's just a blank scene. So I would click on that and I would click add the project, which I already did it, but that's all you would do. So you would add it to that project. It would download it. It will add it to that project. But then let me actually open up that project. So it's literally just downloading or just opening uh, the Unreal 4.27 and having a blank scene, saving that. And then what that's what you're doing is just inserting this in that blank scene. Yep, in which so I'm gonna have to know anything. Yeah, you don't have to know anything at all. You know, about four point two seven nine or five. <laughs> Basically, the latest and greatest for Unreal Engine four, right? And so, this is you can even see like the difference in the UI, right? Like, I mean, it looks really, really dated, but this is Unreal Engine four point two seven, and. You don't have to do anything like if you look down here in the content browser i mean this should be familiar from five but you can see that we have the black outer pack right here and this is the mega scans trees and so it's as simple as right clicking on it and then you see a button here that says migrate and so i i can migrate this into the scene in five that we were just working in right so i'm going to click on migrate and it's going to bring everything over and you don't want to select anything off. You just want to leave it as is because sometimes if you start selecting stuff you want to bring over, it might break something. So it's better just to bring everything in one full swoop and not have to worry about it. So I'm basically just going to click. Okay. I'm not going to click anything on here. And then right here, it's going to open up a, a folder and it's going to ask us where do we want to take it to? And so I have this project file that's basically called teach EJ and that's actually, no, let me actually do this one. Cause that's the one that I was showing you before, but this one, I named it Gus Temple. So I'm going to double click on this one here and then where it says content, this is where we want to select. So double select this one content right here. And then I'm just going to select folder down here in the bottom, right? And you can see that it's copying the files over to our scene now. So that content folder is kind of like your TEX uh, folder in Cinema 4D. It just automatically gets created whenever you import, say, textures into a Cinema 4D file. Yep, 100%. And then there's also there's also a LUT pack because you could do LUTs inside of Unreal as well. So if I come back over to my marketplace, 
and I believe I probably want to type in let's down here and so this is the one that I use is to amplify let pack again they haven't updated it for five yet but all you have to do is add it to your project for 4.27 which I already did and so if you look here we have the amplified let pack and I'm going to migrate this as well so I'm going to right click click on migrate same thing click OK and this should already uh, oh, excuse me should automatically have the content folder already open because that's what we already had open before so I'm going to select folder and that was fast it already migrated you can see in the lower right hand corner migration complete so I can actually close out of Unreal Engine 4 now and if I come over to 5 in my content folder we should see yeah we have the LUT pack we have our trees and everything here so let me actually clean this up because I have all these mega scan assets over here inside my outliner. So, oh, so they, oh, okay. So those are all the things you duplicated. They're all those stones. Yeah. Every time you duplicate it, it's going to pop up in there. So I made a mega scans folder, which I'm just going to click and drag it in there just to make it a little bit more clean, you know? So from here, I'm actually going to, let's actually use the Bob Ross tool. I call it the Bob Ross tool, but it's the foliage tool, but this is how we can actually paint our trees in here. Like, let me actually double click on my trees and yeah, the happy trees in there. <laughs> and let me see, I think, yeah. So these trees are already set up for like the work with the wind and everything. So if I click on simple wind and let me, I'm going to just select this tree and you can hand place these in here if you want. Let me scroll up. And you can see the tree is already moving with the wind and everything, right? And so I have a tutorial where I go really in depth on this. It's about 15, 20 minutes because you could go crazy with like having just the leaves move or each individual branch. And like it gets really, really involved. It's pretty wild. But right off the bat, you just have a simple swaying of the branches, you know, just like a regular windy day, right? And you could come through and just start hand placing these, you know, if you wanted to but we're not going to do that we're actually going to paint these onto our surface here so let me actually come up here in the top left where it says select mode and i'm going to come down here to foliage and so once i have that selected you can see right here where it says drop foliage here it's as easy as coming down here and just selecting your tree and dragging it in so I think I have it docked. It usually works a little bit funky when you have it docked. So I'm not going to dock it. I'm going to click on content drawer. Look for my trees. Where is it? Geometry. Simple wind. And okay. So I guess it's not going to. So I'm just going to actually select maybe like five trees here. So I'm going to hold down the shift. Select these five. Click and drag it into here where it says foliage type. And give out a second to just install everything or import everything whatever it's the one there so you're just loading that onto your paintbrush palette your your easel yeah the easel <laughs> yeah load the trees on your easel yeah so i selected five trees there so it's going to bring each individual one on there but as i alluded to earlier like the wind deformers and everything are already set up so we don't have to do anything crazy in here and if I can't, I'm not sure if you can see it on your screen, but as I, yeah, when I hover over it, you can see it moving and everything, which is really wild. But let's say, um, so right now you see like a check mark, right? And that blue check mark means that's selected. And so if I didn't want a certain tree to maybe work with my paintbrush, I would just select that off. And now like only these four are selected. Like it made that a little bit dimmer, but if I select it on, you can see it's brighter. And that means that we have all four of these or all five of these trees that are able to be painted. So if I come out here into my viewport, you can see we have like this half dome and this is basically the paintbrush right here. So if I just left click, boom, we have all those trees in there, which is going a little bit crazy. It's actually slowing my scene down a little bit. <laughs> so so you got the density and brush size and stuff because I'm, I'm like this is like crazy because this is like the scatter tool in uh so yep. 4d that they just added in the past few versions here yeah so i'd like to take credit for that because i kept showing the guys at epic this tool here and i was like 
Rick, I'm like, you guys need this as cinema, like, because this is crazy. Like, I turned down my density and I just painted, and it's still uh, really dense. So I'm gonna actually hit Control Z, and this is where you know it just kind of just trial and error. So my density a little bit lighter there. Let's say maybe 0.01. There we go. That's feeling a little bit better. So yeah, it's as easy as coming through, and you can Jeez. see the see the God rays God already rays starting right to come there. through. It's built in. Yeah, the built-in God rays, like. <laughs> so is that uh, what's controlling that? Is like that the volume metric object that's in that FX? Uh, wow, dang. Yeah, so it's a combination of things, right? And so actually, let's say we're happy with these trees, right? Like everything is looking dope in there, so. I'm gonna go off the foliage tool, but I would you, tell, I'm just uh, I'm just looking because I guess you could also erase too, right? Like things you paint, you can also remove. Yeah, yeah. So you have an eraser up here. If I wanted to come through and just erase some so of these got trees, a lot more light to come in through here, or whatever. So exactly. Tree. So yeah, okay, cool. cool I could cool. do that. Let's say I wanted to, because you can see like we're getting some nice lighting in here and everything. So delete those. You can um you can remove everything if you want, or you can start painting them in singles if you want to do that as well. Like if I wanted to just have one tree here, one tree there, you can actually individually paint in trees as well, which is really cool. But um yeah, then if you click on paint, that's just gonna be everything, you know, the whole smorgasbord in there. And so let me go back to my select panel so we can see everything in all its glory. But you're asking about the God rays, right? So what's controlling that? It's a combination of like if you don't have the exponential height fog in there, you're not going to see that because it's all the particulates that are inside the atmosphere is what causes the God rays, right? How they refract off the camera and everything. And so the fog is emulating how that would be inside the real world there. So even as the trees are moving, it's kind of hard to see um inside the screen there but i can see it here like as the trees are moving it's actually interacting with the fog which is refracting the light and everything as well so all that stuff kind of plays in with each other like if i come over here to my exponential height fog and i'm just going to turn it off just so you guys can kind of see what it looks like so so I we, come down we, you you adjusted some of the stuff off the top too so okay yeah so that's yeah, see, what's doing it the volumetric fog is really playing a big role in there. If I come over here and let's say my fog density 0.5, you can see that, you know, we're really starting to get it in here as well. So yeah, it's just a combination of playing around with all these different tools and everything. And then where your sun is placed makes a really big um, impact too. So like if I hold down control L again, you can see like the lighting and the placement of the tree really dignifies how those rays and everything, because this is all physically accurate lighting that we're playing around with. So yeah, it's just all about getting that good lighting in there. So I like it a little bit moody. Where so it's let's like say kind of cast it. Yeah. Like that, that's like a pretty dope right there. And then let's cast through. Let's say like we want to see like, you know, our pug statue here is like our hero. So there's nothing wrong with coming in and maybe just adding some like point lights or rectangular lights. So I like starting with like a point light. And let's drag this in here a little bit just to add a little bit of um, lighting in here, you know. And then I could come down here and actually change my light color. So if I come down here in my details panel. I could change my intensity. Maybe let's make it four because we just want a little bit of fill here. Change the lighting. Let's maybe go with like a warmer hue, maybe somewhere around there. And then if I hold down the O key, I could just duplicate that and just really start like painting the scene with the lights and stuff. Because one thing I learned, like I know we want to try to be accurate with our lighting, but a lot of people, like even like on a movie set, you'll see like a crap ton of lights in this because they're like, they're really trying to paint the mood with like how the light and the shadows and everything are working. So don't be afraid to add like a ton of lights in here. Like lighting is going to be your friend. And then also play with the intensity levels as well and the colors and all that stuff. Like 
it's not just like you have to take your time this is like what separates like you know the good artists from the okay artists right so right i know we talk all the time about like if you see a bad redder from unreal that says more about the artist's the artist skill than what unreal is capable of because uh, i mean that's with any renderer at all if if you don't know how to light uh you're probably like the the render is not going to save you at the end of the day yeah and i mean that's why like lighting artists and like photographers like they do really well in this program because they they know what it takes to get like a good shot in camera and so basically that's what you're doing here right you're just staging your scene out and everything painting happy trees and you're painting with light exactly it all over the place so let's say i mean is there anything else that like you know because this is all about trying to teach you how to use unreal yeah. so is there anything that i mean there's one there thing or? where when i would build this in like redshift is there a way just to like increase the intensity of the say the sunlight so those god rays are a little bit stronger yeah so that would be my directional light right so if i click on directional light and i come down here and where it says intensity you can see we have our lux here so let's say i'm just going to go crazy like 40. okay Boom. so that's the overall uh light intensity coming from the sun yep and then you can also change the color as well like if we wanted to have maybe a little bit of oranges in here like doing like oranges and stuff like that so and you can also you have volumetric scattering in here if I okay because that's what up. i was going to ask so, yeah because in in a uh, redshift in an octane you can kind of control the contribution so you like you wouldn't even have to touch the light intensity you could just say hey light contribute much more to the volumetric lighting or scattering so it seems like that volumetric scattering was kind of doing that increasing the strength of yeah. just that uh, volume so i'm gonna take my i'm gonna take my intensity down to 3.16 um instead of unreal that's like what real sunlight is supposed to be right so 3.16 and then let's turn up the volumetric scattering to see so there okay. you go so that answered my question because that's keeping the intensity of the light the same but you're just adding more contribution to this uh volume Yes, 100%. Okay, cool. Answer my question. Perfect. And then I'm trying to think what else we can add in here. So we can add um, a post-process volume so that we can add some LUTs in the here. And so let me see how my scene's looking. Yeah, the scene's looking... I mean, you could, just like you added the uh, the trees and stuff, aren't there? There's like animated plants and, and ground cover and stuff like that you could do too. Absolutely. So if I come back here to Quixel Bridge, um, let me come down here, 3D plants. We actually have a section for that. So yeah, you have all types of crazy stuff you could get. I mean, you have flowers, garden plants, grass, all types of stuff in there. And actually, let me exit this out. Because you can actually. So I did have a question for you about, um, like, if I wanted to create, like, I would use a cloner. If I, like, I was talking from off the bat about that one Pinterest image where there was just moss all over covering the floor. Is there a quick way to, like, add a ton of moss onto a floor? Or is it just all like make, just making like a big brush and painting on the surface? Yeah. I would probably do. Um, I would do the brush. Like if you type in moss here, you can come up with a bunch of different surfaces and stuff like that. So let me see. We have we have a moss. Yeah, so I would probably pick like some moss texture down here that you like and like use that to kind of use the blend material and paint all those in. Um I know there is like moss decals as well. Let me see if I can find those. Oh, decals are something that uh I don't think I've messed with before. Yeah, so these are decals here, which are basically, um, I would say they're like stickers almost. Like you use them to kind of add like the, um, that little polish to your scene. So let me see. Um, so we have a moss patch right here, right? And so I'll download this one. I'll download it at high quality, which is going to give me 8K. And 
like I already feel my machine starting to chug a little bit, and that's because I went crazy for the scene, right? And so typically all the high quality textures. Yeah, most people at work at 4K, you know, that's a little bit more manageable, but you know, I was just showing off here a little bit. But yeah, I would say for most people's systems, you're more than likely gonna just stick with high quality, which would be 4K, and that's totally fine. Now, is this essentially like a uh, uh, a texture with an alpha? Yeah. With bump and normal? Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. So they have something like that in cinema, I guess? Yeah, I mean, you can make, yeah, you can pull the alpha from uh, different images and all that stuff, but it doesn't do it automatically. You'd have to like manually set up all your nodes. Yeah, this one, it should be automatic, so... This will be under, uh, did I not, it should have came up with a decal. So I wonder if I didn't add, add it to my scene. Let me see. Yeah. Cause you can't just download it. You also have to do uh, one more step. Yeah. yeah so download so that, right there and then, and then hit the add button. And that'll so, add it to your open scene which I think I saw something happen. Yep, decal. Yep, there Boom. you go. So decal, mossy patch. Oh, wow. So it just, uh, oh, wow. So that'll just cover any object that That's you're just, seeing right now. And it does the vertex blending automatically, right? So if I, like this, uh, this green box here, this is your volume for your decal, right? And so we have this purple arrow and that's the direction that your decal is gonna be facing. And so like, okay, right now it's pointing down. And so the more I move it towards the ground, you can see it's starting to blend in with the rock and everything in there. So that's almost like a, a like a opacity effector from Cinema 4D or something like that, where you're, it's like a linear field controlling the blend opacity as you go down. That is incredible. I didn't know about that in the decals. Yeah, and so, I mean, this is something that you need to be careful with as well because, like, if there's, like, it, it picks up all the geometry that's within that volume, right? So if I move this over to my left a little bit, now you can see it's starting to stretch on that rock there and everything, and so, or not on the rock, but on the pillars. The and pillars. Those, so Can you exclude objects at all? You can. Um, I can't remember off the bat how to do it, but I know you can do it. I've done that before. So you could definitely go in there and yeah, pretty much. <laughs> but then, I mean, you can also come down here and I'm inside my scale um, parameters right now, right? So I'm just gonna change the scaling on that. So you can make your box tinier if you just wanna have it there, you know? And you can also control these with the your tools up here as well. So. Okay, I was just gonna ask if you could control scale because I know there's some weird things in cinema that like you need to be in object mode to scale it down versus model mode or vice versa. No, you could be yeah, you could be in any mode there and do that. And then I don't know if you saw me like do a quick pan to the thing there, but like let's say like I'm turned off in this direction. I want to look at that moss patch, right? All I have to do is go to the outliner, double click on it. And then it should bring it to the center view of your window. Oh, dope. Okay. So that's like the S key in cinema or whatever where you're uh, active view to object. Yeah. Yeah. That's super cool. So, yep. You just double click on it though and it brings you there. There is a hot key for it, but I don't remember. I think it might be F instead of Unreal. Like I stopped, I stopped using hot keys a lot because I get so mixed up jumping between cinema and unreal it's just see like, that's why we're yeah. that's why we're making that pdf so we can both use it i guess yeah <laughs> yeah practically it's like just have it live on my ipad and have it sit there there but, you go that's that's so cool i i've seen decals just you know in passing using uh quixel bridge for stuff in cinema 4d i had no idea that you had all those like the blending and all that kind of stuff that's so cool and I'm not sure how the decals work in cinema. I guess it would just bring it in as just a texture with alpha, right? Like, I'm not sure if right. it does the blending and all like stuff, you right? Just, so. Yeah, it would be just like a sticker, like you said. Not You wouldn't have that, like, kind of cool blending thing unless you, right. you did some crazy uh, node material setup or something. Right, right. So, um, 
there was one last thing. Oh uh, yeah, we're gonna add in some LUTs in here. Yeah, so let's come down here and I'm gonna add a post process. Do we need a camera, yeah. Do we need a camera first? Can you show us some of the camera stuff? Um yeah, we could add a camera in here. So cinematic like, let's add uh yeah, cinematic camera. Frame up our scene, play with some focal length, depth so, of field, yeah. I have my camera in here and you can see it added like a picture in picture window. And so that way you can still stay inside your viewport, but you can also kind of line up your camera as well, how you want it. So move this up and let's say we want to move it there like so. And also you'd have your control panels down here as well inside your transform tools. And so I usually just control everything inside the viewport, but if you're like a numbers person, then you have those down there as well. Now, can you actually look through that camera like you can in Cinema 4D and orbit around and frame things up looking through, like inside that camera? You can. So if I come over here to perspective, and I already had a camera in there before that I brought over from Cinema, but then this is the camera that I just added right now, the cinematic camera. So if you select that, now I'm looking through the camera, right? So I could use my WASD to move around inside my viewport here. The animated god rays are just killing me right now. That looks so stinking good. And it looks more cinematic, like once you're in the camera and everything, like, yeah, it's really, really dope. So I think we're gonna line it up like that and then let me see. Let me go back to my camera here. I can go through some of the camera settings down here as well. And so if I look at film back, this is basically the resolutions that we have. So they have a bunch of like real world camera. Um, I'm not even sure because I'm not a camera person, but like you could do like a DSLR, you could do like a super eight and yeah, your formats and stuff like they have one for IMAX and full frame DSLRs, you know, different camera types and stuff. So I usually just stick with digital film because that's what it starts off with. But if you're a camera person and you know what these are, you know, then yeah, have at it. <laughs> you know? Except, I mean, you could change like your sensor width and height and your aspect ratio and all this stuff. But I, I don't even know where to start with that stuff. Right. So <laughs> okay Same so thing. this makes a little more sense with the lenses because that's like yep. your your depth of view all that kind of stuff right so let's say we go with like an 85 prime something like that and say like we want to add let's say yeah like a better depth of field right so we have the 85 millimeter prime in there if i come right here to focus settings and this is really cool too so we can actually manually change this but we have a way to display like what's going to be in the foreground or what's going to be in the background that's going to be blurred out. And that's going to be like this little purple panel here. So I want to say, let me pull this out a little bit. It says draw debug focus plane. So if I click on this and I start scrolling in my manual focus, we should see a purple box. So that purple box is going to basically tell you like what's in, in um, focus and what's out of focus. So if I turn this off and then I come down here to focus offset, I believe it is. Yeah, these camera settings always get to me. Like I should probably learn cameras better, right? So <laughs> we'll do Let's it, see. we'll do it. Maybe. So that so basically that purple was uh just kind of everything in the purple color was will be have some kind of blur. Yeah, but I'm just trying to figure out how to blur. Is it your camera aperture that does it? Uh, I believe, uh, yeah, your your f-stop, which is your aperture. So the lower that number, the more depth of field you should get. So if it's like point, point 0.8 or something for aperture. Yeah, it's only let me get a 1.8 here. Oh, interesting. Oh, because it's probably based off of that lens maybe? I don't know. But you, I know in Cinema 4D, like, oh, okay, something's blurring out. So it's yeah, a focal distance. We're getting the manual focus distance there. Let me click on it. Okay, so the purple box, huh. the closer it is. But I think it might be the lens too, right? So let me try. Yeah, because if you're, that's why you're limited to 1.8 because of the lens. So that's right. interesting. So you can't like, 
because uh, I know in um, Redshift, or at least, or you know, standard physical render, you can kind of independently like futz with the uh, like you could have like totally unrealistic apertures, like point zero zero one or something, to get like a whole ton of uh, blur. Yeah, and I mean that might be the case here as well. Like I said, I'm yeah. not too adept with the whole camera stuff, but another tutorial got to do. But that's looking really good with the depth, uh, the shallow depth of field there, though. Well, especially because this is all real time. Like you have no excuse to, like, not learn how to, you know, light or compose a shot just because every time you, like, you're literally seeing what you're getting. Like it's. Yeah, this is what the render is going to look like. So, I mean, that's that's kind of the great part about, you know, not only real time, but, you know, third party renders that are pretty fast because I've just seen in the past few years, like artists, just their lighting skills just go through the roof just because you can learn it so much faster. You're not sitting there moving a light and then hitting the render button and waiting like a minute like I used to do. <laughs> using Yeah, physical no, I, was, I was 4D, there you know? back with standard render and. Uh, yeah, no, I remember those days well. <laughs> yeah. All right, so we we gotta finish this up with a LUT, and then we can you can kick out this render, yeah. Yeah. So let's come over here. I'm gonna go click on this box with the green plus sign. Come down here to volumes, and I'm gonna look for post process volume, and this is how we can add our LUTs. But you can also change everything inside your scene here. But before we do anything. Once I have my post process volume selected, because you can see like we have this yellow box here, right? So the way post process volume works is you're basically like it has a color grading system in there. So anybody that's like familiar with like Blackmagic Resolve, DaVinci Resolve, you know, like how you have this color wheels and you could change like your gamma, your contrast, shadows, mids, like it has all that stuff in here and you can set it up to if you're only inside this volume box that's when your scene's going to be, um, I guess, kind of changed out, which I could kind of give a demo here real quick. On oh, that. interesting. So if, you're, if your actual camera is in that box, it's going to apply that what? Exactly. So let me come down, and I'm just going to apply a LUT real quick just to give a quick example of how that works so everything will start making more sense here. So, I mean, if we're thinking of a video game, you can think of like when you go into a forest – like, I think I, I, I remember this in like Kirby. I've, I've been playing Kirby a lot on the switch. And if you go, you can go from like a nice sunny beachy level or part of the, the level. And then you go into a forest scene and the colors all change. So that's, that's the LUT changing as you're entering a different part of the world. In exactly. That level. So, so that's like if, cool. if you download like a game level from the marketplace, you'll see people mm -hmm. do that. Like you walk into like a house and the color changes. So I'm going to go totally into this. Different this volume oh, here there you go yeah so let me see i can even make it so now it's black and white so like we're in kirby's forest we got close to the statue now it's black and white but if we move out now it's going back into full color so that's cool that's pretty cool like i mean this is more for like gaming mechanics but yeah you know like you can also storytelling as a cinematographer in unreal like this is pretty cool like outside of games like my, my like if i was a better cinematographer i'd be like my my wheels brain my brain wheels would be spinning <laughs> but oh yeah i did all that to say so okay so we have the volume in here but if we want to have everything in a post process volume and golf like your entire scene we just type in unb and that's going to bring up this little button here called infinite extent unbound so if i click this on so now everything that we do inside our post process volume is going to happen no matter if we're within that volume or not. And so I typed in UNB in a search just to get there faster. But like if you just wanted to search for it. Yeah, it's just in like here, the context but, search in Cinema 4D. Yeah. And I mean, there's so many attributes in here, as you can see, that's just the faster way to find it. But if you wanted to manually search for it. It would be under post process volume settings and this is this one right here so it's infinite extent unbound and you make sure you have that selected so now anything we do in here is basically going to engulf our scene right so i don't want to take up too much more time here but you know because there's a whole bunch of stuff in here but we could have better bloom effects in here so if i click on bloom and intensity 
you can see it already gave us better blooms in here. And if I do convolution, this will give us a more realistic bloom effect with our lighting. So you click on that, that gives you more realistic lighting. I could turn that intensity up to one. And then if I come down, let's say down to exposure, I want to change this min and max right here because you can see like it's starting to kind of go for a scene. And so like when you have this turned off, like by default, Unreal Engine is trying to mimic the real world as possible. So like if we had like a house in here and you're inside the house, you know how like your eyes adjust to the lighting. So when you step outside, everything just kind of like your eyes have to adjust because they're getting so exposed by the sunlight. Unreal tries to mimic that as well. So if you're running into that, basically like this min EV100 and max EV100, I would usually just set these to one and that would give us a better situation there. And then you might have to go back and, you know, change your lighting as well because it's um turning off that, I guess it would be like manual exposure or automatic exposure. I'm not sure what you would call it, but. So if you were having a camera move in the scene and you came from that, like the, the big canopy of trees, you would see that that compensation happening and this is just turning that off so it's yeah so uh, it's okay it's making sense. yeah so i'm going to turn my sun back up here maybe like 10 something like that then let's come back down here to post press volume i mean there's a lot of stuff that i would just say come through and just play with whatever's down here like if you could have um chromatic apparition if you want you know like turn that up now we have chromatic information which i always like to add just a little bit in there you know but can you yeah. add like you know how a lot of people like to add a little bit of grain just to like people will leave grain in their render just because it's got a nice look is there something like that i was going to say you could bring in your own grain texture like that's what this dirt mask is right here and i don't think we have any built into unreal but like if you like went into photoshop made like a dirt mask or a grain texture or something you would just add that there and then you could mess with the intensity and everything in there as well if you want to do that and then yeah you have camera settings in here like again i don't know anything about shutter speeds and ices and all that so down here we have color grading too you know so if i open up so it's like you don't even have to like you know, render this out, go into After Effects, do your curves adjustments, da da da, you know. Now, nah, like you just practically turn it on. Let's say I wanted more contrast. You turn up the contrast there. It's a little bit too much, but you know what I'm saying? Like saturation, come down to zero, make everything black and white, go up to 50, uh, really oversaturated. So, like if you're a colorist or if you like doing your own color, then you have all those different attributes in here as well and you can even adjust it down to your shadows your midtones your highlights all that stuff so when which i know that you've been working on a more detailed scene that you actually uh you did from scratch in a tutorial which we'll put the link for that tutorial in the description of this tutorial but i was wondering if you could open that one up and just kind of see how much more detailed you can get and like how unreal is actually still running really really fast in your viewport and I was wondering if you could show me how, or show us how you can create a camera move and then we can get to like rendering out an actual uh, animation. Yeah, 100%. So on my screen right now, I have this scene that I was working on before, just getting a little bit more detailed. So if you actually look at the ground, I'm using the same techniques as I was before. Like we have some mega scans rocks in here. You can see we have some light glistening off the stone because I actually painted some puddles in there and everything just to kind of give it some wetness and things of that nature. And then I have some Japanese light post in here. And if you look really close, you can actually see I'm lighting them up just with, you know, regular point lights in here and everything. So that's kind of giving like a cool ambience once we're looking inside the camera. Like it looks a lot different when we're inside the camera, which is really cool. So I will always suggest when people are actually working on Unreal and you have like a camera set up to how you want it. So like if you look at my camera right here, you can see like my composition looks way more cinematic than me just inside the viewport here. And if you ever want to just like pin it here, you would just click this right here. And so no matter what you do now, your camera is always gonna be pinned in place there. So 
I usually like keeping it there in the lower corner just so I have like a point of reference to see what's really going on because that's going to be what your final shot looks like right there. And so if I scroll up into or if I just move up into my scene a little bit, as you can see, I mean, it's more detailed, but it's still just the bare minimum. I only care about what's going to be in camera. So I have a lot more foliage in the scene. I actually have some trees that are behind the camera because I wanted to have like some cool shadow coming from the, you know, behind the camera and everything because of where I have my my sun place. So even stuff that's off camera is even important because that would help out with your composition and lighting as well. So that's just, you know, some composition tricks that you learn as you start really, you know, going in here and messing with it. And that's the cool thing about Unreal is you can kind of just iterate on a fly and make some of this stuff happen. So that's a breakdown basically of my scene there. Yeah, this one that I'm working on here. I still have a few things that I want to add to it just to kind of round it out and everything. But for now, I guess we could get into me showing you guys how we could create a timeline. We could bring the camera into the timeline, maybe do like a simple animation with the camera and then render this bad boy out. Yeah, that sounds awesome. I, I can't wait to see how fast this renders because that's that's the key here, right? Yep, 100 percent. It's all about that real time rendering. So we're going to start off by coming up here to where we have this clipboard is that what that's called? You know, that clapper like whenever clapper. Yeah, something. Yeah. yeah. OK, so <laughs> do you have on. to have your like for something like this? Do you have to have your camera selected or is this just something separate from whatever cameras you have in your scene? Yeah. So the sequencer, that's your that's what the timeline's called inside of Unreal, right? So when oh, you're okay. adding the sequencer, you don't have to worry about anything else, because once we bring the sequencer in, then we'll start dragging in the elements that you want to animate, which is really cool. Oh, okay. So, you don't have gotcha. to worry about your cameras or anything like that. Basically, you would just come up to your clapper, come down here to where it says add level sequence, the top one right here. Just click on this and then you can make a folder if you want. Like if I right click, make new folder and I just call it maybe like sequencer or whatever you want just to keep it organized, then double click on that. And down here, I'm just going to name this one, let's say tutorial scene. But you can name it whatever you want, basically. So I'm going to click Save. And now you can see inside of my raw outliner, I have this little clipboard and this is tutorial scene. So basically, this is my timeline. So anytime if I ever want to get back to my sequencer, you would just double click on that and that will bring it down here into the bottom. But this should all look very familiar to you, right? Like you can scroll back and forth. You have your frame. You can switch out your frame rate here, which I guess we're going to go with 24, right? You want to do film, 24 film. Yeah, get that cinematic film look. So we got that. You have your your ins and outs. So you can see like your green right here. That's going to be your end point. You have your out point at the end there. And depending on how many frames you want to make it, let's say 150. You want to make sure you have your output on whatever that's going to be. So you can type in 150 down there. And that's going to make the length of your your um, sequencer down here. But you want to make sure you come down here and you hit the right bracket and that's going to bring it over to the end. So whatever is inside of these brackets, that's what's going to render out. So that's really important. Like you could come down here and actually drag this out a little bit just so you could kind of see past it if you want to. But whatever is in those brackets, that's the only thing that's going to render. So, OK. Kind That's of similar to Cinema enough. 4D, where you got that frame range and all that kind of stuff. If you're not paying attention, you could not render out your entire sequence. Yep, 100%. So I know some people, it'll hit me up on YouTube or whatever, and they're like, why isn't my stuff rendering in? That's usually the case. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So always pay attention to your brackets. And can you just click yep. and drag on those brackets to move them, or is it? Uh... Yep, 100%. Yeah. Okay, so cool, cool. I like using the shortcuts down here just to get a little bit more precise. But if you gotcha. want, you can always click and drag. But as you can see, you don't see what frame you're on, right? Yeah, Especially once okay. your frame so starts getting really precise. long. So yeah, usually I'll bring my, um, I'm not even sure what that's called, like your working. Your playhead. Playhead, yeah, your playhead. There you go. I'll bring it to the frame that I want, and then I'll mm -hmm. just hit that end bracket, and we're oh, good to go. go. Cool. And so what I'm going to do from here, I'm actually going to hit this button right here. This is going to save everything. You always want to save or hit Control-S. You know, that's that's a must right there. 
and then I'm going to come up here into my outliner where I have my camera. So I'm mm -hmm. actually just going to left click and drag this into my timeline. And that brought everything in here. So you can see we're actually looking through the camera now. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, mm -hmm. and they actually added this thing called camera cuts, which I'm going to delete this because this is really, really important as well. Like this, when I was first learning Unreal, this is something that really threw me off. And so when you have your camera inside of your sequencer, like you can animate it and everything like you, these little plus buttons down here. These are all your keyframes. So let me actually animate this first and then I'm going to show you why the camera cuts is really important. So let's just say I'm going to scroll back into my scene and we'll just do like a simple push in. So I'm going to start here and then I'm going to come down here to where it says add a new keyframe. I'm just going to add it to let's say location because we don't need rotation or scale. I'm just going to do like a simple push in. So now I'm going to go to the very end of my timeline here and I'm just going to hold down the right control on my mouse, hit W just to kind of push in a little bit like so. And then I'm going to hit the button down here again to add another keyframe And the shortcut for that is actually S. So if you want to add a, um, a keyframe in there, you just hit S and I should add a keyframe in there. Not sure what the S stands for, but <laughs> you know, it is what it is. But there we go. So now we have a simple camera move in here. And for those that like to move with like, you know, curves and stuff like that, if you come up here in the up right or the top right, right beside the FPS, you click on that and it actually brings up your curve editor as well. So if you want to kind of work on your moves a little bit more, making them a little bit more dynamic or, you know, have better ease in, ease out, you have full control over your curves there as well. So I'm actually just Just going like to your F curves, right? In uh, C4D. So. Yep, 100%. It's very similar. Yeah, C4D or even After Effects. Like, I mean, it's right. very similar to basically anything with the timeline <laughs> you know, you're going to have your curves yeah. in there, right? Yeah, so. keyframe's a keyframe. That's why I always say if you want to get good, <laughs> just learn animation principles because it, it translates. Keyframes yeah, acts like keyframes no matter where you're at. I mean, as far as I know, curves work the same across the board too, right? Like, I mean... Yeah. It's yeah, just so. the, key, the shortcut key is S for... Swoosh, Laying your keyframe movement. There. Yeah, I don't know. Slaying, <laughs> slaying keyframes. They say yeah. smooth, sh movement. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, like so, if you didn't want to work with like curves or something like that, and you just want to make like a constant move, like I don't know if you notice when I hit play, oh, like linear keyframe. Exactly. So like yeah. it, it kind of ramped up, and now it's ramping down, yeah. which that doesn't look that doesn't look natural right so right. if i select my keyframes here and i just right click on my keyframe then you can come down here you can make linear keyframes um constant um not really sure what like cubic break does it does something with the interpolation but i usually will come down here to linear and now you just have basic you know the the um the velocity is going to be the same throughout so you're not going to have a ramp up you're not going to have a ramp down unless that's something that you want but this works particularly well if you want to do like multiple camera shots and stuff like that. You know, you want to have a constant camera move. So that's just the quick and easy way how we could get constant keyframes in there. And um, what was I talking about before again? Oh, yeah. Camera cuts track. So this is really important because if you try to just render out from here, your camera is just going to go below the surface there and it's not going to pick up anything that's inside your sequencer. I'm not sure why Unreal works this way, but this is something that always throws off anybody that's new to Unreal. You know, they're really excited. They got their scene all animated. They got the thing all played out. They go to render and it's like a blank slate and everybody always hits me up like, hey, why doesn't my stuff render? And I'm like, did you add a camera cuts track? And I would say 99% of the time, that's pretty much the issue right there. So I'm not sure why Epic works this way, but if you come down here to track, you see right here, we have like this green plus button. You want to click on track right here. And this is going to add a camera cuts track. So you want to add this one right here. And that's going to come up and show this camera cuts track. And this is where you would select your camera. So you can actually have multiple cameras within your sequencer, which I guess this is where the camera cuts is going to make sense. So like if I click on camera, I select the camera that I have in here. Now it brings up this big image here. I'm not really sure what you would call it, but it kind of works like uh, like a nonlinear editor, you know, like if you're using oh, like, like in Premiere, you get that exactly. Yeah. 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 So okay. it's just like Premiere. You have the preview in there 
and you can actually add several previews. So like say I take this end and I drag it over to here. So it's just gonna play what's in here and then actually let me select my camera in here. And then once that's done, then you see it comes out of it. So it's almost like we have a nonlinear editor within Unreal Engine here. So if you wanted to set up several of these with several different cameras, you can actually make an edit so you don't have to go back and like keep re-rendering out the scene. You can lay out your edit fully in Unreal and you know do like a full animated short piece in here, which is really cool. So this like re this reminds me of like the stage object where you can like keyframe. Well, I mean, it takes keyframes, but I mean, this sounds like the camera cuts is like you can actually use the camera cut track to cut two different cameras in your shot or in your scene. Yeah, and now that I'm thinking about it, I guess that's why they call it camera cuts, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, you're cutting a different camera. <laughs> yeah, so it's making sense now. There we go. So got we this got this nice camera move. Yeah, we're just pushing in. So let's say that we're ready to render this out. You want to make sure that you click save on here again. And then you want to come down here to this other clapper that's in here. And it would actually say like render this movie to a video or image frame sequence in which this is another important part. So if you click on these three dots next to it, you want to make sure that you're using a top one. This is movie render queue. You don't want to use movie C or what does it say? Movie scene capture. And this is legacy because that's the old school way of doing it. So before Epic started doing like virtual production and all this other stuff in there, like the way that you were trying to render stuff out of Unreal Engine was pretty chaotic. And they kind of did away with that system in lieu of this new system that's more, you know, prevalent for us, you know, motion graphics and broadcast and VFX artists and stuff like that. So you want to make sure that you have movie render queue up here selected. And then you can click on your, your clapper there. So once you click on your clapper, you're going to see that you have your sequencer right here, the one that you named tutorial scene. And you'll just want to come over here to settings. And then you can pick what you want to render it out as. Like we could do a JPEG, which I'm going to delete that in lieu of something else. So if you click on settings, you can see we have export settings down here. So if you want to do like a bitmap or EXR, if you want to do PNG, Apple ProRes, you do have the selections down here. For this um, tutorial, I think I'm just going to go with the PNG. But an important thing is if you want to do like any type of um, alpha channels or if you want to do any multi-pass rendering, you're going to need to do a AXR. PNG won't really work out for that because you're going to want like that 16 bit of depth in there. So that's just one caveat. If you want to do like multi-pass rendering or any type of alpha channel, you definitely okay. want to select that one right there with the 16 bit. But yeah, it's this... weird they don't have a uh, uh, 16 bit PNG because I was just thinking this this reminds me a lot of uh, like Adobe Media Encoder where you can yeah choose all your different stuff. So so PNG is actually limited in Unreal. It's not that like 16 bit version that you can choose in After Effects or uh, Cinema 4D. Yeah, and I think that's because whenever they were kind of going around the industry asking like different VFX houses and stuff like that, like what their compositing workflow would be and what they would want implemented because this is all still pretty new to the system, right? And so okay, I guess yeah. a lot of the compositors, especially like new compositors and fusion compositors, they were all telling Epic that they're using EXR workflows, which, you know, that mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense for what they're doing and stuff like that. So I think they really focused on EXRs for multi-pass rendering and everything else, you know, it's it's there, but you know, it's only at eight bit um, increments there. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's one of the things you gotta tell Epic, we want 16 or 32 bit PNG <laughs> file. There you go, yeah. Well, so. and you, you tell me this all the time is that the more artists start using Unreal and the more we communicate with the folks at Unreal, like, you know, the, the studio capacity is talking a lot with uh, Epic and, and getting a lot of requests in, like, features and, and workflows that make sense for motion designers like ourselves. So, uh, yeah, it's 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 uh, going to be exciting to see where things kind of evolve because, yeah, like you said, Unreal used to just be for games and now more and more people are using it for production and making short films and all that kind of stuff with this. Yeah, it's been used across everything across the board. Like, you know, we just did the article on School of Motion, kind of showing where Unreal Engine's being used in other places. And 
yeah, it's kind of crazy just doing the research for that, seeing where Epic is kind of popping up at. So, yeah, it, it could do a whole bunch of stuff, not just motion design. Like, if you know Unreal, like, especially if you're on, like, a job hunt or anything like that, then your tool set is just going to exponentially be that much more vast. So you'll be able to take on jobs in different fields that you might not even have thought you might be working at. You know, like, you could be working at Boeing or at some type of like general hospital or something crazy like the the possibilities are endless there which is kind of nice you know that just for like job security and stuff like that yeah just so you know yeah i mean how many jobs have you gotten just because you're on the cutting edge and you actually know unreal probably a, a ton yeah a lot um how many jobs have i turned down <laughs> <laughs> probably even more right <laughs> yeah i mean we have a couple of friends that they get requests all the time just because everybody's looking for unreal artists right now so there's a lot more requests out there than there are artists that know it so that's why i tell everybody even if you don't want it to be like your main thing you know like at least put it into your tool belt just so just in case if you're having trouble finding work there might be something else out there for you so yeah. I mean, this is the whole point of this tutorial, right? Is to just get people using it. And if they like it and want to learn more about it, they know exactly where to go. And if they are like, you know what, this just doesn't work with my brain yet. That's fine too. At least you gave it a shot. Right. But a lot of people don't even just give it a shot. And, yeah, and actually is... go no, ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no, go ahead. I was going to say, and we're, we're like bearing the lead of like the main benefit of using the unreal, which is, you know, how quick this thing renders you know right which we're going to get to right now we're going to set this up super simple but before i did that i wanted to show that we do have some options for multi-pass rendering down here like it is it is limited to which you can render out right now like we have our lighting passes reflection passes um we could do path tracing not sure what ui rendering does in this case but i know they are expanding on this too and stuff like that like we can do crypto mats, which I do have a tutorial on my site, how to do crypto mats and how we could do stencil mats. And so there's a, um, there's a different type of setup for that, but that stuff is implemented in here as well. But for this example, I think we're just going to stick with our traditional image sequence. I like doing PNGs. And so I'm going to come down here to output, and this is where we're going to select where we want to output it. So I think I'm just going to save it to my desktop. Like I'm just going to make a new folder, call it tutorial, save selected folder here. And then I'm going to leave everything else as is. So I have 1920 by 1080 and we should be good. So like our sequence name right now, it's going to call it tutorial scene. But if you wanted to rename it, you want to make sure that you have it within these brackets. So if you see right there, it made it a little bit larger. It says bracket sequence name bracket and then frame number. You just want to rename it where it says sequence name so we can actually name this one like pug statue or something like that so now so this is almost like a, a like a c4d tokens and stuff has their own right unique like system where you have to do the dollar sign and stuff like that and if you don't have the dollar sign it's not going to take so very similar yep. i guess right even though i never did understand the dollar sign but <laughs> Neither did I, but it, it's very powerful. And I'm sure they got something like that in uh, Unreal as well. So now, all right, we're about to hit the render button here. So the we're going to we all been waiting for. We're going to hit render local. You can do render remote if you have like several computers. You can remote them together, but in most cases, you're not going to need to set up a render farm. Like you should right. be good with <laughs> <laughs> render local unless you're working you'll on see like why, the. Yeah. Give this a second to load up. It should only take a moment or two, but now you see oh, there we go. we're inside of our render. So we're going to try to talk over it, even though it's going hella fast. If you look at my yeah. estimated time remaining already at 10 seconds, if you look on the right, you can see the frames actually counting up in real time. It's going crazy fast right here and we're done. So that's, done. that's it right there. That's like it. If, if I come over to my folder, there we go. So we have a full image sequence in here. All 100 and what is it? 150 frames. 150 frames. 24 yep. frames per second. 24 I'm frames per second. I'm not going to do that math. I don't know how many seconds that is. But it's, yeah. you know, it's, a, it's a few seconds, and it took a few seconds to render. Yeah, so the only caveat is, so if you do multi-pass rendering, of course, that's going to you know up your rendering time. So 
-hmm. if you add like let's say like a reflection layer in there then you have you just yeah. have to take it to account that it's going to be rendering it twice and so instead of 30 seconds to render the entire thing it's going to take 60 seconds to render the entire thing so the more mm -hmm. stuff you add to it on the rendering processing side the more time you're adding to it but it's still a lot faster than you know what we're traditionally used to so i think now, uh, I, it kind of outweighs I it oh, go ahead. yeah i was just gonna ask like in those render settings because you know, when you render out of Unreal, you can kind of get that video gamey quality, you know, but I noticed there is like anti-aliasing and high quality are those things that you app that you n could add to your render to make it look a little bit more like you rendered it in um, like Octane or Redshift or something like that. Yeah, 100 percent. So depending on how your scene is, you know, particularly pertaining to you. If you need, like, if you have, like, really fast moves and you might notice some pixelation in there, I haven't really noticed it too much, but you do have the option to add anti-aliasing, which you could do, like, per, um, temporal sample count or spatial t um, sample counts in there, and you don't want to raise it up too much. Like, it would actually give you a warning, like, okay, if I put six in there, it's going to, you know, tell you, like, maybe you want to start lower and kind of raise it up, because the more samples you add, of course, the more time you're going to add to it, so... I mean, this stuff gotcha. renders pretty fast. Like you could kind of just increment it and see where you get to a number where you might want to get to, but mm -hmm. you can add that. And then high resolution, this is actually added for, if you're doing more like key art stuff. So, you know, like the giant billboards and stuff that you might see like down there on sunset, if you're doing stuff for like print and you need to render mm -hmm. at a higher resolution, you can always oh, okay. add high resolution and you can actually do it as like a tile count. So it's going to actually render with buckets and everything. So it has a lot of really cool render options in there, depending on what you're trying to do. And um, yeah, you can even come down here to, let's say like console variables. And if you're into like any type of programming, you could kind of add your own variables in there. And so you have the flexibility to kind of program stuff in as you need it. Like if you want to raise up ray tracing or, you know, anything with the shadows, you could kind of program that into yourself. So, you know, if you really want to get in depth into, you know, really fine tuning your renders, you have all the mm -hmm. flexibility in the world to do so. Very interesting. So it's, it's kind of because I remember uh, when I would do sketch and tune renders, you wouldn't want the animation to be kind of smooth. You'd want sharpness. Mm -hmm. And so what you would want to do is actually remove the or not remove the anti-aliasing, but make it less blurry because the anti-aliasing by default is the animation codec and it would like like you said, like if you have fast motion, it would kind of smooth everything out. And if you didn't have the anti-aliasing high enough, it would look really jittery. So it's interesting right. that this is kind of the same thing. So if you if you do have a lot of fast movement, throw on that anti-aliasing. But I wonder how uh, yeah. how that looks now or how, how quick that would render. I just want to say you can actually come down to your, um, your post press volume and you can actually mm -hmm. turn off motion blur too. So like oh, if okay. you're if you want to do something like that, I, I would probably say even come down to motion blur, come down mm -hmm. to your amount and just kind of zero everything out like so. Oh, okay. And then so you you're not going to have smooth. that. Yeah, you can make your everything is going to be sharp within your mm -hmm. render there, so you don't have to worry about any motion blur or anything like that. But if you wanted to test the um, let's say the anti-aliasing, maybe let's try it by like two. So come back down here anti-aliasing let's add it by two and i forget which one does which because i'm not really i don't really use it too much so i do temporal sounding or sample count two and let's hit render again and let's see how much time it adds to it yeah how long did it take like 20 seconds for that last one yeah about That's, 30 uh... seconds but this is still kind of cranking in there so yeah Looks like it's only going to be yeah, yeah, like right, 45 like, seconds. And are you seeing on your end like a noticeable difference between the alias one and the anti-alias one? I mean, I'm not seeing a huge difference in there. And that yeah. might be because the scene's already clean to begin with, right? Like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I know like people always had like the interpretation of like unreal giving you like a gamey look but i felt like that was yeah. more like unreal engine 4 compared to 5 like i feel like in 5 people are getting a lot more photorealistic renders out of their scenes like 
if you just go on like art station or YouTube or yeah. TikTok and stuff, like you're seeing people make some really insane renders. And it's just like, I didn't even know Unreal was capable of doing that, you know? So I think Unreal Engine 5 really, you know, stepped the bar up into like how they're rendering everything. Yeah, I think, I mean, this is the whole key of why we're doing this, why I want to learn it, why we're doing this big old contest and everything is because people have like myself i have my misconceptions about unreal and even you did that you you would just think that anything rendered in unreal kind of looks video gamey and like cutsceney and you know just doesn't look that good and not production uh doesn't have like production uh ready results or something like that and with unreal 5 like i've already been you know just researching for you know what we're what we're trying to do here we're trying to educate people we're trying to get people excited and amped up to try unreal for themselves giving them an opportunity to take their first steps in it and i'm blown away by the level of quality like as you've been building this scene the the material mixing thing the real reflections on the water like everything in it the animated trees and foliage and all that stuff like my there's like many my mind blown head emojis that have been like going <laughs> off in my head while you've been it, uh, demoing this all. I mean, and this is just getting started, right? I mean, it's right. hard to showcase everything within, you know, just a couple of hours, but I feel like sure. it's a good jumping off point. Like I think once people really get acclimated and comfortable inside of it, who knows what they're going to create? Like, I know we've had friends, you know, like, they just started learning it and they're already putting out stuff that looks similar to what they were putting out in like Redshift and Octane. And so I know, um, like we both know Garoon, I mean, he learned Unreal in 30 days and he's putting out freaking cinematic video games and presenting it in front of the world. So, I mean, yeah. the barrier of entry, I think is very low, especially with it being free. It's kind of like, why not try it, you know? Right. It's and not I think like it's you have just, to pay a monthly subscription or anything to jump in. Right. And if you don't like it, you have to cancel it. It's like, it's there. If you don't like it, then, you know, you try it at least, you know? Yeah. And I think that's the main thing too, where a lot of people are afraid of even learning cinema 4d and just getting into the world of 3d. And one of the big barriers is they just don't know what to make or how to start integrating it. So that's why, you know, I'm, I'm a big proponent of, of contests and prompts like this of hey learn unreal if you want to learn unreal here's an opportunity here's an actual thing to do with some constraints here's a project file here's how to do some of these things to just get your feet wet and like i i think i've mentioned this before but like i thought this was going to be a lot more difficult i thought my head was going to hurt by now <laughs> <laughs> and actually it has i mean there's been a little weird things like you know, you got to do this because if you don't do this or like the camera cuts, if it's not there, you know, it's just how this works. But I mean, there's a lot of stuff like that in um, in C4D and After Effects. So it's just like you just got to get over your yep. yourself with that kind of stuff and just realize all softwares have their little quirks, some way more than others. Um, but I've I've been this has been a very eye opening experience. And I hope everyone else that's watching this is feeling empowered and and realizing this isn't all that hard like i definitely didn't think it was going to be this easy to start uh making a scene like this um but uh I, i'm really excited to see how many people take that jump with us uh, with me at least because i haven't touched <laughs> unreal before um and see what people come up with yeah, and I mean, we're going to supply this project file. Well, not this one, but the one with the pug statue and then the ground plane that at least gets you started. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a camera in there and everything. So I would say watch the announcement video because we're going to go through all the different steps and all that stuff to get you guys started. But yeah, we're going to supply you with what you need so you can create something similar to what we made here, kind of follow along, and then hopefully make it your own. Yeah, and there's going to be some sweet incentives for you to try unreal for the first time because we got some pretty badass prizes from some amazing sponsors that we've managed to get so if you haven't heard about all of that be sure to check out the contest announcement video you'll find all the info there and then we're going to be making videos along the way to kind of help you out doing some live streams as well answering your questions i mean i don't think i'll be able to answer many questions but i know Windbush <laughs> will be able to you know hopefully no. do that but super excited to see what people come up with and Wimbush thank you so much for walking me through Unreal 
I'm super excited to get off this uh, stream and get working myself. Maybe even do a tutorial of me just trying to scramble and do it myself. Yeah, Maybe we do that. Cool. But also, you have, just to reiterate, you have a tutorial that shows how to build this specific scene uh, that you just rendered out as well, correct? Yeah, so I did a tutorial. It's going to be a little bit more streamlined for people that kind of just want to follow through and everything. So it's going to be basically building this scene out. So make sure you go to my YouTube channel to check that out. And then we're going to also have a page with all this stuff listed too. So if I did any type of tutorials in the past that I think will help you guys in your journey, you know, like how we added the camera cuts track, like I have a you know, a specific tutorial just on that stuff and getting it set up, everything inside the render queue, you know, like I've been covering Unreal for like the past three or four years. So I'm going to create yeah. uh, pretty much just a playlist of all the stuff that I think that's going to be problematic for people that might be just like, hey, how do I find this or how do I do this? Pretty much, I think I covered everything at this point. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, we'll make the list, we'll put it up there and hopefully you guys will be able to be on your way. Yeah, awesome. Well, I think that's it. We'll get everyone back to creating. And uh, yeah, I can't see what people come up with for this contest. And I can't wait to see that final string out of everyone's work that submits something. 100%. All right. Well, we'll see you all later. And can't wait to see everyone's Unreal renders. See right, ya. Take care.